Referred to as the Mona Lisa of the North, this painting's continued to fascinate and baffle art lovers in equal measure. The subject evokes mystery and makes the viewer question many things. Who is this woman? Why is she looking right at us? Why is the background so flat while she's rendered in such a dynamic fashion? Is she turning away from us or toward us? And what forced Vermeer to forego the idyllic landscapes and domestic scenes that he so loved? To focus on a single subject with little to nothing surrounding her. Johannes Vermeer is one of the greatest Dutch painters of the Baroque era. He's known for his pensive, contemplative style that quietly records domestic events. Vermeer belonged to the Delft School of Painting, whose main base was in, you guessed it, Delft. The school was concerned with the harmonious proportions of the city's interiors, their general atmosphere, and ambiance. The most famous painters of the school were Peter de Hooch and Vermeer. The latter, of course, is the name that has gained more favor over the years. Look at these great scenes with little to no impetus from the artist. Scenes of domestic life rendered as they are. You might be asking, what's wrong with the girl with the pearl earring? At first glance, it seems like a highly uncharacteristic work for the artist. It does not present a domestic scene, nor does it have his signature perception of depth. Most of Vermeer's paintings are quiet examinations of his surroundings, with a kind of detached affection. For instance, this busy painter's unaware of our presence. And so is this woman reading a letter. This woman's not pouring the milk for us, and this lace maker's not engaged with us. We are but passive onlookers, observing these narratives play out from afar. However, this painting is anything but passive. The girl breaks the fourth wall and stares directly at us, engaging us with a piercing intimacy. Unlike most of Vermeer's subjects, she acknowledges the viewer's, or rather, the painter's presence. Vermeer showed a penchant for this technique in some of his earlier works like The Girl with Wine Glass. It's difficult to ascertain whether she's interrupted by the artist, but he makes it quite clear in this painting, titled Girl Interrupted at Her Music. But in the latter part of his career, he developed a liking for the fourth wall break, portraying subjects as they're interrupted by someone's presence, presumably Vermeer's. Painted in 1665, Girl with a Pearl Earring was lost for about 200 years. Its resurgence in the early 20th century and restoration in the late 20th century was met with enthusiastic commotion. Today, it's one of the most recognizable works of art, alongside Van Gogh's Starry Night, and of course, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, with which it shares many similarities. Both paintings are inherently mysterious and are painted with unusual skill. Vermeer's use of color and reflection is absolutely breathtaking. The light hits the girl from the left, illuminating and separating her from the dark, almost featureless background. How her luminous skin glows on one side and is clouded by shadows on the other. The skin's rendered with clean brush strokes, providing remarkable detail to the facial features, and the earrings painted with a few masterly brush strokes to emphasize its reflective properties. The blue and yellow colors not only heighten the impact of light, but also complement each other to balance the composition. The gloss and sheen of the oil painting exaggerate these technical aspects to provide an impeccable vision of sublime beauty. But let's talk about Vermeer's body of work and why Girl with a Pearl Earring stands out. The painting's caught between two contrasting impulses of the mid-17th century. One has to contextualize the art of the 17th century to understand the appeal of Vermeer's work, and this painting in particular. Now, we're gonna go on a bit of a detour, so hang on. The early and mid-17th century had an affection for experiment and observation, beginning, of course, with two esteemed philosophers. The first one's Francis Bacon, who established the foundations of the scientific method in Western Europe, and the second is René Descartes, who posited cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. These significant developments provided the stimulus for a new dawn in the realms of art and science. Take a look at the quiet inspection of nature in this painting the most famous image in the Netherlands for quite some time. One can also notice this newfound penchant for observation in Rembrandt's work, but no artist adhered more closely to what Descartes described as the natural light of the mind than Johannes Vermeer. But there's a yin for every yang. With increased trade and wealth of Western European nations, smug self-importance was bound to find its way into the Baroque bloodstream. And in the later 17th century, it did. The Dutch were no exception to this. The East India Company made some people in Holland very rich. Consequently, the Flemish painting of the late 17th century had plenty of depictions of self-indulgent bourgeois rituals in pompous settings. This could be easily noticed in the work of Peter de Hooch. 
which goes from presenting serene domestic scenes to depicting pretentious villas in a span of mere 10 years. No surprise, then, that the Rococo artists were inspired by the late 17th century Flemish combination of ostentation and glee. One may think that these changes also affected Vermeer, and he changed his style and interests in later life. But before the stale and gouty lifestyle of the late 17th century became common, a different brand of Flemish painting thrived in the 16th and early 17th century. Most Flemish painters were inspired by the Italian Renaissance's naturalistic renditions and used those techniques to present works of grandiose theatrical aura. Peter Paul Rubens is an excellent example of this phenomenon. His charged compositions have a will of their own, and the movement contains multitudes of expressions. This expressive instinct gave birth to another unique northern painting genre, Tronies, a label many historians attach to Girl with a Pearl Earring. In 16th and 17th century Dutch, Trony meant face, so Tronies were idealized and overtly expressive paintings during the Dutch Golden Age of painting. These paintings were a far cry from the calming demeanor of Vermeer's work. In fact, they were the complete opposite. But in 1665, Vermeer made his foray into this genre. What makes these paintings quite interesting is that they somehow reconcile the expressive nature of 16th and early 17th century Flemish painting with Vermeer's characteristic restraint. Chonis's generally idealized and expressive intents were incompatible with Vermeer's personality and understanding of the world, so he moved the goalposts. Girl with a Pearl Earring may be a Troni, but it's a far cry from the norm of the era. It is a work of subdued mystery. Instead of expressing an evident emotion, the girl's feelings veer into abstraction. Is she happy or sad? Is she about to say something? Notice the parted lips. Does she yearn for the artist or is she moving away? Her face is not looking at us, and it isn't in profile. It's somewhere in between. The choice of rendering the face at an angle makes it near impossible to identify the woman. We do not know her hair color, nor can accurately make out her facial features. Some art historians think that the woman did not exist, and Vermeer painted an ideal picture. But one can almost sense a familiarity in her eyes, which makes other art historians insist that it might have been a local woman, presumably someone the artist knew. This ambiguity adds to the painting's sustained mystique and fascination. Today, the work hangs in the Marditz House Museum in The Hague, a stone's throw from the Prime Minister's office, and right next to the Binnenhof, a medieval complex that contains both Houses of Parliament. If that doesn't tell you how important the work is to the Dutch, I don't know what will. In the 17th century, the Dutch began to value self-rule, relying on maritime trade and a merchant class to help run their cities. Smaller towns like Delft had no supervision from kings and bishops, so merchants became patrons. They often focused on representing their wealth through portraits. The pearl, then, becomes an emblem of wealth, a symbol of the merchant class's newly acquired status. But wait a minute. Is that pearl just hanging in the air? If you liked our content, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one.